Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is 7 o'clock here on the east coast of the U.S. For folks who are on the west coast, it will be 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But in Australia, it is bright and early, I believe 9 a.m. Um, tomorrow morning in Wednesday. Our speaker today is Professor Ted Gardner. You'll see their sporting and very jaunty hat there in the top left corner. Uh, he is with Victoria University. Underneath there is one of our board members and the host for today's session, Ben Keeley, who is the director of Aris Water. Our sessions today are underwritten by The Wet Show, Water and Wastewater um, Education, tra Transport and Training. And we would like to play a, a greeting from Douglas Lugo. Hello. Hello. My name is Douglas Lugo, the director of the Wet Show. I'd like to welcome you to the session. The Wet Show team has put together a series of CEU qualification classes that we hope you will find helpful. These are uncertain times. It's extremely important to be up to date on how the wastewater industry has been affected during COVID-19. The Wet Show team has launched the Wet Plus initiative as a one-stop shop for resources meant to help our industry stand tall. Please visit our site, The Wet Show, that's www.ettshow.com, to access these resources. And remember, we are essential. Thank you, and enjoy the session. We are extremely grateful to Douglas Lugo yeah. and all the folks at The Wet Show. Uh, for underwriting our Adobe platform this year. We're going to be hosting quite a few different sessions from throughout the world and certainly some more sessions from Ben's corner of the world in Australia. At, at this point, Ben, I would like you to introduce the session today. Thank you, Dendra. Um, today's session is Professor Ted Gardner on looking at uh, the reuse of rainwater in urban watersheds and is it uh, uh, drinking water that is safe to use. Ted is an esteemed water and soil science professional here in uh, Australia with a long career in the Queensland government and uh, when he retired from that he's gone into uh, writing textbooks, doing a whole heap of interesting consulting programs and uh, Putting together with fondness, I think, large PowerPoint presentations. So, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, talk to us about this. I think you uh, have a, a textbook on this topic, Ted, published by the International Water Association. I think it's even uh, moved on to their free to download. Um, part of their website. So if you find this topic very interesting, I'm sure Ted can talk to you about the, the textbook from the uh, International Water Association. So over to you, Ted. Thanks, Ben. Oh, good morning. Oh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I see Ashok has joined us. Hello, Ashok. Um, and he'll, Ashok will be very familiar with this work because um, he and I work together on a number of the projects. So the outline, it's a little bit more than uh, that health, although clearly uh, health risks from pathogens is one of the more important issues. But you can see that I'm going to um, talk about uh, the history of rainwater tanks uh, in civilization, um, what they look like, um, how, how effective they are and why they're effective, and, and can you actually prove they're effective, how we might make them uh, uh, more mainstream by turning them into communal tanks, and are they competitive economically with, with traditional water sources? Uh, the other issue is, do they have an energy penalty? And I guess the issues that are more pertinent to the question of, of the talk is, um, what's their water quality? And uh, what are the health risks? So um, moving on, the, as Ben said, this is uh, um, the book on which this presentation is based. There's a lot of graphics that I've used here that actually come out of uh, the book, which, uh, which has got 11 chapters from different authors. So instead of acknowledging every graphic, I'd just like to acknowledge that this is the source book. And you'll see the, um, the web link down in the bottom. It's now um, uh, free online because uh, some uh, benefactor uh, allowed it to be uh, 
uh, subsidised. Somebody paid a substantial amount of money to IWA. When I say substantial, I mean you know in the thousands of dollars to allow it to be open access. Uh, to which we think it's a great idea because it was really designed uh, for the whole world, not just for people in Australia or developed countries that could afford the rather high price at the time. So just to give you a little bit of geography, where we are in Australia and uh, the, the top right hand side is Queensland, the state where I come from, and down in the bottom corner is Brisbane, which is the capital city, and I live about 100 kilometres away from Brisbane. Um, so the history of, uh, of rainwater tanks is that basically without, um, without rainwater, there wouldn't have been many of the civilizations that, that came. In fact, the Minoans, which is 3000 BC, started to do some really interesting hydraulic um, structures in terms of capturing and moving and storing uh, rainwater and stormwater. And uh, that continued on uh, to various places in the Mediterranean and, and the Levant. And, uh, and then in Roman times, they really supersized it, but it continued on into the, into, uh, the Roman Empire, which was uh, the Byzantine, and then the Venetians and the Ottomans, where they just got bigger and more sophisticated. And then, of course, we, we came up with reticulated water and we basically forgot about them for quite a while, unless, of course, you happen to live on a farm without reticulated water. So in those days, this is ancient times we're talking about in the Levant, um, the rainfall was usually very low, although in Crete it was, I was just looking at the numbers, I was surprised it was 800, but these wells were stone walls, or, or, or wells with stone walls that were plaster coated for waterproofing. They're about 10 to 60 kilolitres in size, and I'll tell you about a unit conversion in a minute. So if you're, if you're thinking US gallons, I'll tell you what that means in a mo moment. And they had very sophisticated, um, uh, conveyance structures and I went to Crete um, about uh, 20 years ago at a conference and I was absolutely amazed at how sophisticated their stormwater and rainwater and sewerage infrastructure was and I sort of you know fell in love with those those ideas uh, and concepts and then when the Romans took it over of course they supersized everything um, and uh, it just went on from there a few pictures of um, the, the technology from ancient times there's a a large Minoan uh, rainwater system. This one's got steps in the side, so that's really quite large. It's probably around the 50 kilolitres. And we're talking, you know, 2,000 years BC. So we're talking 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. And the civilization's building those conveyance structures out of terracotta, um, or alternatively carving them into um, the bedrock, which is often limestone. And in some cases, building really big ones um, for public buildings, like the, the, the uh, picture on the bottom right hand side, which is a greater than 100 kilolitres that used to have a cover on it at one stage. So moving on to more recent times, rainwater tank ownership in Australia is very, is very high. About 34% of Australia's uh, households have rainwater tanks. There's about almost 9 million households in Australia for 26 million people. And you can see that, um, that uh, uh, Queensland, QLD, uh, has a high percentage uh, in capital cities and also in the uh, outside the capital cities, as does New South Wales. This is in terms of numbers, of course. New South Wales is a much more popular state than uh, Queensland. And if we actually um, look at um, uh, uh, who owns them, you can see that 15% uh, of people in uh, Brisbane own them and 28% in the rest of the state. But you can also see if you go down to the next one, that the, the number of people, tank owners, that are using it for drinking water. And if you um, then move to the right and look for Australia, you can see that around 10% um, of 11% uh, of, of capital city owners drink rainwater, and that increases to 26% for the rest of the state, which would be rural areas or provincial cities. So the take home message there is a lot of people drink rainwater in Australia. Why do people have tanks? Well, um, there's a sustainability ethic, although that's relatively recent. Um, Hydro water substitution for non-drinking end uses. Well, that's certainly uh, a big thing uh, when you are uh, got a constraint with reticulated water supplies. Certainly one of the big drivers of the millennia is the millennial drought, which was the big drought that hit Australia basically from 2000 to 2009. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Rebates, there's nothing like a subsidy to encourage people to contribute their own money. Regulation, 
And finally, no access to mains water, which is the situation I'm in. I live in a rural area and I don't have mains water, so I have to supply my own. So just to give you a bit of geography, this is southeast Queensland, uh, Brisbane. Um, I don't know whether you can see this on the screen as I move the cursor. Uh, perhaps you can. There's Lake Wyvernhoe, which is the major source of urban water supply for southeast Queensland. And that's what it looked like in uh, April 2007. We're in the middle of the millennial drought. Uh, it looked like Brisbane you know, and 3 million people or so were going to run out of water. And that's the prediction, prediction of what was going to happen. But uh, by about there, you know, in December 2008, we were going to be in big trouble. So there was a lot of initiatives that were taken, but one of them was um, introducing legislation that mandated, mandated that new homes had to have um, uh, a, a, an alternative water supply, which was basically rainwater tanks, which were assumed to uh, produce 70 kilolitres per household per year um, for a detached home, in other words, one that's freestanding. And uh, But it turns out that in 2013, that legislation was revoked for various uh, political and economic reasons. But um, And in New South Wales, there is a, a legislation called BASIC, but it's a sustainability legislation which requires houses, new houses, to uh, have a 40% reduction in mains water use and greenhouse gas. And uh, basically they fulfil that 40% reduction in mains by uh, putting in a rainwater tank for non-potable purposes. And that's still uh, active today. So the unit conversion for uh, my uh, American colleagues is that a kilolitre is 264 US gallons or and a US gallon is almost equal to four litres. A metre is a little over 39 inches, and one inch is about 25 millimetres. And I'll also be talking a little bit about dollars. So um, you can see that an Australian dollar is 65 US cents. So if you bring your American dollar over here, you'll be able to buy many more Mars bars than you can buy in America, which uh, I found interesting at the time. Now, this is the anatomy. Uh, of a rainwater system. It's a rather complex slide, but basically the, the um, water comes off the roof, goes through a first flush device, goes into the rainwater tank, where it then goes through a check valve and a pump, and then is reticulated to the toilet, the washing machine, the, the washing tub, and maybe the hot water service. And there's a switch, and the main water supply comes in, because if it doesn't rain or there's not enough water, there's a switching valve which switches over the supply to these appliances to mains water instead of rainwater. That's um, what it looks like uh, in reality. You can see the tank. Uh, in this case, it's about a 4,000 litre uh, aluminium tank. You've got the first flush device here. Uh, I've got a mesh a filter here for, to stop the leaves getting into the tank. Um, and there's an overflow and there's also a um, supply outlet. So that's Pretty, pretty simple, but surprisingly difficult to get right all the time. If, in fact, you come to my place, um, uh, which Barman's been to, uh, it's a bit simpler. Um, I've got a big concrete tank uh, in the it, b below my house, and it's powered by a electric pump. And so subsequent to that photo, I put in a filter for my grandchildren's visit, uh, and there's an interesting story to tell at some stage about why I forgot to turn the filter on. But the kids are still healthy and alive, so no harm done. This is the um, uh, sort of concrete tank that's in my house, but more conventionally, they, they're made out of polyethylene. They come in different sizes and shapes and colours, and they've just exploded in terms of choice. But most of them, if you're going to put it into a house, would be cylindrical, and they would be about five kilolitres, 5,000 litres. There's a mud made out of zincaline, painted zincaline. We call that colour bond. The, the, uh, the product in Australia is called colour bond. The paint's um, attached to the the zinc loom in the factory. There are bladders, tanks. If you, you can't, you don't have enough footprint, you can put a bladder underneath your house uh, and that's not, and that'll be the order of uh, perhaps two to 3,000 litres. Not very common. Um, now the, if you, you don't want gunk to get into your tank, I mean, it's inevitable that some of it does. So what you do is this is a cross section of a house. This is the rain gutter next to the roof and it goes through a, a screen. Uh, which um, filters out the leaves and larger material. But there's also a, a first flush device, which is, um, this is a cartoon that I had a fellow who was 
who worked for me years ago was a very talented cartoonist, so I asked him to do something for me, and this is what he came back with. Like um, <clears throat> all theatre, it's always a bit exaggerated, you know. There aren't really dead people on the roof, but there certainly can be uh, bird feces and possum feces and lizard feces and, and stuff like that, uh, which you don't really want to drink. And that's what it looks like in this particular case. This is a first flush device, and that's the buffering storage. And I'll just show you how it works in, a, in, another, in another slide. Um, well, what is it? it um, well, it's a device that diverts the first one or two millimetres of runoff uh, from the roof away from the rainwater tank, and it's diverted to the stormwater uh, and off into the, uh, the drainage system in a way. And the reason we care about it is, is that Often the first, uh, the first flush of runoff from roads or roofs or whatever often have the highest concentration of contaminants. And there's an example of uh, copper runoff from a, a European roof. And even after two millimetres, uh, it's still, uh, are still pretty high. And in this case, you'd have to argue that perhaps four millimetres of runoff would be required to get to a concentration that's acceptable, which would make the yield very low. Um, but there's the more conventional... Um, uh, first flush device. The thing about rainwater technology, generally everything's become simpler, either because it's become more sophisticated or it's become simpler, but it's certainly usually become more effective. So this is a linear first flush device, and basically it works on the principle that the rainwater comes in. This is a float valve, and the uh, it's the float valve rises as the contaminated water comes in, it reaches the top, basically closes off the entry, and all subsequent rainwater goes off into the tank. So, and there's a little weep hole at the bottom here so that after the rainfall event's finished, this water here will drain out of this reservoir and the thing's reset. So completely driven by gravity and uh, generally works well unless, of course, the weep valve clogs up. Oops, wrong direction. Um, and the other thing is that rainwater pumps, you need, usually need a, 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 um, an energy source to move it around the house. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, electric rainwater pumps that are on the market, and this is a very common one in Australia. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about pumps later on in the presentation about their, their energy penalty. The, but the last uh, bit of technology that I'd like to talk to you about is the backup water supply. Um, when I first started looking at tanks, there was a, there was a simple um, a float valve arrangement that when the float valve uh, fell too low, the, the, this valve opened and, uh, mechanically and the mains water supply came in and topped up the tank. But then they were replaced by a, a rainwater switch, an electronic rainwater switch, where they, they, uh, there was a pressure sensor in the tank, and when, that, when the pressure level fell to a certain value, it then told the, pressure, the, rain, the rainwater switch to switch over, and then the water that was being supplied to the house came from the mains water supply, not from the tank. So that was pretty neat. That's what it um, looks like uh, in, in practice. There's, they're not particularly big. There's the mains water coming in and the water coming out. And if, when that's switched off, the water comes from the tank into the house. And when it's switched on, the water comes from the, the this uh, tank water is turned is turned off and the mains water goes into the house. So, and you can see that uh, if it's not functioning properly, because when it defaults, you know, if it, 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 it um, defaults to a situation of always allowing mains water to enter the house, uh, which can be a recipe for for not so much disaster, but a recipe for for unexpected, un unanticipated outcomes uh, if the device doesn't work properly. So, moving on about um, you know, we, we love rainwater tanks. We think they're a great idea, but uh, do they really work? Um, well. I did some work, uh, started some work um, quite some time ago uh, uh, to look at a subdivision uh, at the, in a suburb of Brisbane. It's called um, Payne Road. And um, 22 houses, and it was on the edge of the of the urban development area. Uh, yeah, Ben's asking me, would you use that pointed to? Is that, that right, Ben? Yeah? Okay. So this is... Um, uh, it was on the edge of, a, edge of the urban area, so it couldn't easily be supplied with potable water and sewage, so they had to come up with their own system. But each house had a rainwater tank and it had a, um, a, um, a on-site uh, sewage treatment system uh, for, uh, for grey water. And we did quite a lot of uh, instrumentation monitoring, uh, just to give you an idea of where it is. Here we are in Brisbane, so this is southeast Queensland. Uh, this is the Brisbane city centre. And 
where over here is where the gap is, just to give you an idea of the uh, geography. That's it. Great. Thank you. And uh, another Google view. Again, I, I, I like geography because when people talk about their results and I'm not sure uh, where it is, it, it just makes it a little bit easier for me to understand the, the story. So there's the city centre for Brisbane and there's the gap and you can see that there's a bit of a mountain range on either side. And I must admit, having grown up in Brisbane, it never occurred to me why did they call it the gap I actually saw that photo and it's really quite clear that is the gap and there's a creek that runs through there and ends up as Breakfast Creek, for those of you that know Brisbane. So there it is, 22 uh, lots. It goes from Anogra Creek at the bottom. It's about a 60 metre rise up to the hill. So we're going from right to left. And uh, they all had a rainwater tank. They were topped up from a large communal tank, although that wasn't a big deal, but they had treatment for the rainwater. And uh, also, because the communal tanks were connected to the, uh, because the individual tanks were connected to the communal tank, you could both supply uh, water when, when there was not enough rain, and you could also add water when there was too much rain. So that's there's the hydraulic structure uh, of it, which is basically, um, it looks like not all the connections have been made on that slide, but basically the tanks supplied the, um, the house, uh, and uh, the tank supplied the house, and then they um, then went in any then any surplus uh, went into the um, communal tanks. Because some of those lines have not come through on that slide during the transfer, uh, I'll just move on from it because it's really probably causing you more confusion than enlightenment. And basically, this is the um, how an individual tank works, where you've got the supply for the house, any of that uh, surplus water goes off in the community tank, and you've also got a little bit here for firefighting. But uh, And there's a submersible pump in this particular situation, which is very hard to hear when it's working, and even harder to hear when it's not working. But of course, you don't get any water in the house. But these tanks supply all the water. And that's a typical situation. This was a fairly upmarket subdivision, and uh, so the houses were pretty posh. And there's a 22 kilolitre tank that's underneath the house. Um, and there's the uh, uh, picture of the uh, treatment system. This is the filter to take out the chunky bits and the ultraviolet light to kill the pathogens, hopefully. There's the communal tank at the bottom of the subdivision. These are the 275 kilolitre tanks. They store the overflow and they also um, pump up water into the into the houses if there's a lack of um, lack of rainwater. And inside this shed, uh, there's the plumbing arrangements of the, to um, do the reticulation when needed. But also, most importantly, there's a diesel firefighting pump <coughs> inside that shed because it's all very well to have rainwater. But um, if you have a subdivision and you don't have adequate firefighting uh, flow, you won't get approval to, to build it. So this provides, this is a, a real challenge because one of the reasons we need mains water is that you have to have, uh, the rules say that you have to have 15 litres per second coming from two hydrants with 10 metres of residual head after you meet the peak daily flow demand. So that's really quite a high flow rate. And uh, this Payne Road development was, was the first to, to get around that problem uh, for uh, subdivisions with rainwater tanks by coming up with this idea of a, a separate uh, firefighting pump which is hardly ever used. Um, so um, the um, water self-sufficiency, uh, we monitored this for uh, 30 months, 90% of the water that was used in Payne Road came from rainwater. And that's a pretty high percentage. But what's even more interesting, and this is quite a high water use, by the way, 130 litres. So we're talking about 80 gallons per person per day. What's rather interesting about that is is the probability distribution of the rain uh, for about 50 years. And when we were doing these experiments, this was the annual rainfall. In other words, these were sort of drought years. Now, there would, there would only be, uh, this is a 10% uh, uh, rainfall year. So in other words, there's 10% there's 10% uh, uh, probability that uh, the rain would be uh, less than that, or in fact, a 90% probability that it could be higher. So there's the median rainfall, which comes in at about 1,100 millimetres there. And you can see that it was really quite a low rainfall period when we were doing the monitoring. And that really impressed us, actually, because we were thinking, why so? Why are rainwater tanks so effective? 
And um, and the reason is, um, and I'm just showing the map again, I'm going to talk to you about Lake, Lake Wyvernhoe, which is uh, the Wyvernhoe Dam, which supplies most of the water for southeast Queensland. So it's just a geography reminder for you. And uh, this is what happens when you plot the runoff against the annual rainfall. In fact, you really need somewhere like four to 600 millimetres of, um, of, well, at least you need 600 millimetres of rainfall before you get any runoff, you know. And you need more around a thousand before you get anything substantial. So that's because catchments are dry, and a lot of them, and the rainfall events occur every every so so often uh, in the sense that it's distributed over the year, and it goes into dry soil, and it's uh, you need extended periods of rain to generate runoff. That's not so uh, on a roof. It's an impervious surface, and even though there's a bit of initial loss. Maybe perhaps 80% of the rain or more that falls on a roof can go into a tank, potentially go into a tank, whereas more like 15% of the rainfall on a catchment uh, will run off. So tanks are excellent catchment, uh, roofs are excellent catchments uh, for rainwater. So the next question, I guess, you'd, you'd, what you'd ask is, um, is how big should the tank be to size matter? Because people think, well, if you need to supply, say, 50 kilolitres of water, do you need a 50 kilolitre tank? Well, well, the answer is no, you don't. Um, most people, uh, so we built a, a rather sophisticated uh, water balance model for a run water tank. This is some years ago, as you can see, over a decade ago. <clears throat> but there are dozens of these models around um, of different levels of sophistication because most people like to build their own in a spreadsheet. This one's got a little bit of Fortran in it, but it's mostly spreadsheet. It, you've got an end use, which is quite important because one of the messages that I'd, I'd like you to take home from this talk is that unless you run a rainwater tank very hard, that is, um, it's always got an air gap before the next rainfall event, it's not going to be a, have a very effective yield because you don't want a full tank when it rains because all that rain's just going to overflow into the stormwater system or, or whatever. And then, um, so there's the, the roof, the catchment area, there's the first flush device, and then there's the garden water use. So in this case, that was a, a fairly sophisticated wall balance of the garden, which is a bit unusual. Um, one of the issues that are important to uh, be able to run those models is to know how water is used inside the house. And these are end use studies, which are very difficult to get good data for. And there's been some really excellent work done in, um, in southeast Queensland um, over the last 10 years. But these are these are studies from Perth over in Western Australia, Melbourne, which is uh, the south in, in southern Australia, and the Gold Coast, which is um, south of Brisbane, about 100 kilometres south of Brisbane. You can see here the washing machine, the toilet uh, contribute almost 40%, and the, um, and, the, and the bath and shower, well, you could have some of that. Uh, going being supplied by rainwater so you can see that rainwater can can substitute a substantial quantity of the water that's used inside the house which doesn't necessarily have to be potable although it certainly has to be of a standard that's so there's the um some of the results <clears throat> we're looking at the effect of um the annual tank yield against the connected roof area and if we just take this line here which is the um you know these lines here respond correspond to different amounts of end uses so just follow up the top here, you've got the toilet, the laundry, the hot water system and the bathroom connected. So as the connected roof, and this is for a five kilolitre tank, so it's pretty small. And if you connect 200 square metres of roof, you'll get uh, about 100 kilolitres a year uh, out of that, which is which is really excellent. You won't get 140, but you'll get 100. And you can see that if you only connect it to the toilet and you've got 200 square metres of roof, you'll only get about uh, 40 kilolitres. But even if you only connected 100 square metres of roof, you would um, get about the same yield. So in other words, with small, with, if you don't run that tank hard, it's going to be full of, it's not going to have much of an air gap. And so all that extra runoff from the extra 100 square metres of roof isn't going to be used, it's just going to run off. <clears throat> so you can keep it empty more of the time uh, if you uh, use connect the rainwater to more end uses in the house. Um, so this is just to dem for 100 square metres of roof, it just demonstrates that as we increase the end use, we increase the yield for the same size tank. I uh, don't think we need to worry about, well, only in the sense that what happens if the tank gets bigger. Um, I can't quite remember what the end use, oh, the demand's 172 here, okay. 
So you can see here for a 200 square meters of connected roof, as we go from a three kiloliter tank up to a 20 kiloliter tank, you can see that the yield increases uh, substantially, uh, but probably not enough to warrant putting in a tank that size. So um, that's that's true at Payne Road with 22 houses. But the one thing we know about people is that they they vary. You know that they vary in their behaviour, they vary in their attitudes, they vary in their attention to detail. So to believe that what happens with 20 people is what happens with 20, 20 households happens with 20,000 households uh, is a heroic assumption. And if you're a water planner and you're saying, well, you know, we, we're putting a subsidy in, a rebate of X thousand dollars for these new homes, um, and we're making people pay extra money to put these tanks in, um, we, uh, is it really delivering what we think it's delivering? Because the legislation that I showed you earlier in an earlier slide assumed that that putting in this sort of tank of five kilolitres, connecting it to 150 square metres of roof and, and connecting the end use to the toilet and the washing machine uh, and the outside tap would save about 70 kilolitres per household per year, um, which is just a modelling assumption like a lot of models. They can be uh, encouraging, but perhaps wrong, but useful. And so um, we did a study where we actually um, surveyed um, about a thousand homes, and we did it in four different shires or four different local authorities here, southeast Queensland again. Just to remind you, there's Brisbane, there was Payne Road that we we're talking about before, there's the Gold Coast down here, and here are the other three areas that we're looking at. And basically, um, what we did is is that we recruited, we, we recruited, uh, looked at the records of about five thousand households, which required getting approval through um, privacy regulations because we had to access their billing data. And we basically compared the water use from those houses that had, had mandated rainwater tanks and compared that with the water use from houses that didn't have rainwater tanks. And so we had the pair and then we adjusted their water use per household by the residents per house, uh, which was just a, a, a small modification. It didn't materially change the results, but it just made the the analysis a little more elegant. Um, and so by comparing those two water use uh, per person per year between the, the two cohorts, those with mandated tanks, those without mandated tanks, we could work out the savings. And lots of data in this table. Um, we actually ended up recruiting almost 700 households uh, for the size. And we found out that in two years, this is 2009, 2010, the average water savings was close to 60 kilolitres per household per year, which is very encouraging, really encouraging, which you know gave the, the water planners um, substantial confidence that um, the policy was working. Uh, nonetheless, um, tanks were no longer required to be mandated after the drought broke. Now, the other approach um, to look at uh, rainwater tanks is to say, well, instead of having an individual tank, why don't we just have a communal tank, a big communal tank? Because generally speaking, even though we believe small is beautiful, um, economies come with scale. And it's this balance between decentralised supply and centralised management, and which has lots and lots of advantages, which I will talk through later. But here's two schematics. Here's the one where you've actually got a sloping side and there's a, a communal tank in the in the middle, which is a big one. The um, the, the uh, runoff from the houses, the blue runoff, goes into the tank where it's treated and then it's reticulated back to the houses and they're the red lines. And if you have a, uh, uh, well, this is one, sorry, this is a flat area. And this is area here over here is one where you've got a slope which goes from left to right, uh, which means that the um, getting the water from the roofs into the tank uh, is a lot easier because gravity is doing the work for you. So there's the con concept. The runoff from the tank goes into a central uh, communal tank where it's uh, treated and then pumped back and reticulated into the homes. Now, in this situation, you're basically turning rainwater into potable water. And um, this is an example. Um, how are we going for time? 7.37. Might just skip this one, uh, Dendra, and um, I'll just um, hopefully jump over to... Is this going to work? To Fitzgibbon. Okay, now um, this is a, a, a communal system. Uh, it's um, Fitzgibbon again. This is Brisbane City Centre. It's an outer suburb of Brisbane. Um, 
if you've been to Brisbane, you came into Brisbane Airport there and Fitzgibbon is up here to the north, which is, uh, and the Brisbane City Centre is over here, down here. Uh, it's um, about 1,800 dwellings. It was developed by the Government Land Development Corporation and it was meant to have uh, sustainable, demonstrate sustainability, um, the best examples, best in class of sustainability and uh, also to provide affordable housing for people because it, they tend to be smaller blocks and smaller houses because at the time uh, around there housing prices were going crazy and it was very difficult for young couples to find enough deposit to move into a house so there were some social planning objectives about that as well but uh, basically they had connected um, uh, 110,000 square meters of roof well we divide that by 10,000 we've actually got 11 hectares of roof which are connected and uh, it generates about 90 uh, uh, megalitres of runoff and it's going to supply about 45 megalitres. I'm sorry that slide's got cut off at the bottom. I can't quite remember what the last thing is, but that's not too critical. There's the schematic. Uh, it's that the in this particular case, the runoff from the homes, in this case here, this is development area A, development area B, it goes into these um, subsurface concrete tanks, which I'm going to show you a picture of in a moment. Then it goes off into a central storage, uh, almost a one megalitre tank, 1,000 kilolitres, treatment facility into a buffering storage, and then it goes reticulated back into the houses as potable water. So in other words, this is taking rainwater and instead of and turning it into potable water and putting it back into the main system. So instead of having to build your own separate reticulation system, second reticulation system as you might with recycled water, you're actually using the mains water system, which is owned by the uh, the uh, water utility, and with all the political difficulties that come with that. So there's a uh, the sub there's uh, the subsurface storages. They're made out of stormwater pipe. Uh, it's, they've been adapted, uh, readapted as as uh, underground storages. Um, this is not uncommon in Australia now. It's, this seems to be a very effective way of um, creating um, a storage without taking up a lot of footprint for available urban land. Then it, that water is then pumped into this uh, big buffering storage, which is uh, almost uh, a megalitre, 800 kilolitres. Then it goes into a treatment system where it goes through um, uh, um, granular activated carbon ion exchange, some macrofiltration, um, some chlorine dosing and some UV. So quite a lot of treatment. And this is the actual buffering this is the storage which is used to distribute the water the treated water back into the main system or that's the plan anyway um, so um, the um, the problem there was um, the, the, the problem with with Fitzgibbon was a regulatory problem um, as, as in America we're upset we're, we're all utilities are absolutely frightened of litigation or worse than that actually having a outbreak of a health issue which damages their reputation because uh, like all water professionals in most parts of the world they are strongly motivated to supply a safe water supply and sewage system for that matter so there's this general conservatism from the water utility engineers and regulators and um, also this concern of well if we allow you to use our main supply um, what will be our legal liability so this system cost um, I think uh, a few million dollars to put in there's, uh, the details of where the money came from aren't important but it wasn't it wasn't built as a business proposition it was built as a proof of concept and there was quite a lot of um, Japanese money uh, that came into it, of all things, because uh, the Japanese at that time were interested in trying to do, uh, break into the Australian water market, uh, which turned out to be not a successful um, venture for them. But anyway, um, they were interested in doing these sorts of things and they provided quite a lot of money uh, for this system. And basically, it's, it's there and the water utility, five plus years after it's been built, seven years after it's been built, they're now on the cusp of coming up with arrangements where they'll actually let this treated water go back into the system. So any innovation, particularly radical innovations in, in water supply, happen very slowly. Uh, 
which is, I guess, the conservative philosophy. Economics, of course, is um, the other issue. I, I just said that the Payne Road one probably, uh, well, it wasn't. It was funded largely by um, by uh, public capital of some sort. But economics is a, a really interesting issue because that's what. Whenever you're trying to change something, people are going to say, "Well, we can't put um, more pressure on the uh, more, more financial pressure on the customer." So one of the criteria that they use to decide whether an alternative water supply or sewage supply or whatever is in fact uh, cost effective is they work out the levelised cost. So sees the capital cost. It's not a terrifically clear equation. Sees the capital cost, and the, this line here is the the sum of all the annual operating costs. And the denominator is the sum of the annual yield. And there's a discount rate uh, to allow for the fact that uh, money next year is is um, uh, worth less money than the money in your hand today. And usually it's used at about 3 3%, sometimes 6%. And I'll just show you some numbers. This is some, these numbers, although these graphs were pretty simple, there was quite a lot of sophisticated economic modelling behind all of this. Again, a lot of it will be found in the Rainwater book. So this is the levelised cost for a communal rainwater system um, for a 3% uh, and 6% discount rate. Here are the number of householders connected. Now, at Payne Road, I think it was about 1,300 uh, households connected, so way over this side of the, the graph. But let's have a look at the 3% discount rate, which is what governments tend to use. You can see here that after about a, a 100 or 100, 200 tanks, you can see that the price of water has fallen levelised cost per kilolitre to a little over $5 a kilolitre, which is not very much more than the cost of mains water today. So pretty pretty attractive, actually. Up here is the cost of an individual uh, rainwater tank, such as at Payne Road uh, or, or my house. And it's more like $11 per kilolitre, uh, which, is, which is double, over double the price of mains water. So from an economic point of view, the government says from levelised cost, it doesn't look like these individual tanks are really worth it, worth it economically. And if that's all we're going to focus on, we're not going to use other criteria. We're not going to look at any of the other externalities of water quality or um, stormwater control or anything like that. If we just ignore all of that, rainwater tanks, individual rainwater tanks don't look a particularly good, uh, attractive proposition uh, economically. And... That argument uh, carried the day uh, about a few years ago, about uh, 2013, and the legislation in Queensland to mandate tanks was, was struck down, but not so in other states like New South Wales and Victoria, which had more of a sustainability ethic in their government. But still, still in all, communal tanks, around 200, system, uh, system 200, um, is, um, is going to work rather nicely. Now, now, Ben, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I was going to jump... If I, you said I a little note here that I've got plenty of time, um, can you jump me back to, um, to Capo de Monte and there's some stuff there I'd like to show? Is that possible? You know, when I have the jump button or would you... Or could I do it? Um, Mount Tambourine. Uh, here we go. Let's click on that one. No, that's not it. Uh, does that look good? Okay, there we go. Um, so this is Capo de Monte. I'll just go back one. This is a retirement village behind the Gold Coast. It's up in the hinterland. And um, this is the slide set I jumped earlier because I was concerned that I was going to run over time. It's behind the Gold Coast, uh, which is south of Brisbane. Here's Brisbane again. There's the Gold Coast, which is a great um, tourist resort when people are allowed to be tourists. Uh, and I guess it'll be a great tourist resort again when COVID's over. So here are the retirement villages. Each house is connected um, uh, to a communal uh, drain, communal stormwater drain, in this case, collection pipe, which goes into these communal tanks, 200 kilolitres, where it's treated and then it's reticulated back into the houses. So um, there's, uh, there's about 50 residences. And uh, it's, the treated rainwater is used for all internal purposes except toilet flushing because they also happen to have a recycled water system, which I won't be talking about uh, in this presentation. Uh, but the other thing I'd like to stress is they have a backup supply from a bore, in other words, groundwater. So if they run out of rainwater um, for any reason, because of a 1 in 10 year drought or a 1 in 20 year drought, uh, 
they've got the groundwater to back up because these people are at the top of a hill and there is no mains water uh, in this in this tampering area. Everyone has to supply their own water, so there's no alternative. So if you if you were to really run out of water, people would have to truck their water in. And in fact, there are businesses which truck water in to people without main supply. So this is um, um, a, a nicer diagram to to uh, illustrate the point. Here are the houses, raw rainwater going into these um, buffering into these collections, buffering storage, collection storages. Then they go through a treatment system, sand filtration, ultraviolet dis disinfection, and chlorine uh, dosing. Then they go into a buffer tank, and off it goes back into the houses uh, for potable use. And there's also a big pump that allows it to go off for firefighting, which I've talked to you about at Payne Road, because the same people that design Payne Road's hydraulic circuit also design Capo de Monte, that's Bly Tanner. And this is a picture of the system. These are This is a 200 kiloliter tank, and there's its partner. Um, this is the sand filter here, and the, um, and the UV system, which is over on the right of it there, and the rainwater pump. So again, it's not particularly complex. Um, and it um, has been exceptionally efficient. If you, we look for the period that it was monitored, it, it, this was the, uh, the amount of water that was required per household per year was, uh, I think, 7 and 30, about 45 or 42 kilolitres per household per year. And rainwater supplied most of it. The bit I'm not going to talk about, and I'm going to disobey my own statement, is that the actual recycle water did an enormously good job at supplying the toilet and the irrigation system. But nonetheless, coming back to the rainwater system, bore top up was still important. But the other thing, and I'm going to talk a little more about this um, later on, is that the um, specific energy, how much, how much energy is used to pump a pump, treat and pump a kiloliter of water? Well, if you look at it, at 6.24 kilowatt hours per kiloliter, and we compare that with what happens with a main supply, where you're often talking it's sort of less than two and sometimes one kilowatt hour per kiloliter, you can see that there can be a substantial energy penalty uh, when you use these decentralised systems, unless you're particularly careful. So um, I'm going to, that was just to give you a, perhaps a better feel for what a communal system looked like. Oh, and this is some long-term uh, some modelling that was done. This is the reliability supply. This They, they had these uh, 200 kiloliter tanks. They had a 98% reliability. In other words, they didn't need any more top-up if you uh, over a 50-year simulation. But on the other hand, they could actually get down to an 80 kiloliter tank and get a 90% reliability, and, um, and they get the other 20% or the other 10% from the bore. So there's quite a lot of flexibility when you start looking at the odds of supply and what sort of risk you're prepared to accept. And I would have thought in this particular situation, um, saving the money going from a, a 200 kiloliter tank to a, a, an 80 kiloliter tank is probably worth it. Um, so I'm just going to now just quickly flick through, because this, um, uh, this was the Fitzgibbon presentation that I, I was talking about. And we're gone on to the economics. So um, so back here, we're, we're saying that if you've got about 190 homes that are connected to a communal system, you'll be able to supply water at, about, at, a, at a price very competitive with traditional mains water. And the other, the other thing that people are interested in is the net present value. Basically, what's the, uh, the present cost relative to the future cost and the discount rate, et cetera. So it's all standard stuff when it comes to any economic analysis. This is the cost per household, you know, over the lifetime of the of, of the system. So again, if we're looking at um, at uh, communal tanks, when you get around two hundred, you're looking at somewhere between ten and twelve thousand dollars, which is the cost to the life cycle cost to the householder. Had they put in a, a five kiloliter tank, it would have come in at uh, about twelve and a half thousand dollars. So in other words, communal tanks can be uh, substantially cheaper uh, than individual tanks. And we saw before in the previous slide that the actual levelised cost was considerably cheaper for the communal system than the individual tank. So I have to say that in situations where communal tanks can be used, and there are very few where they can't be, um, it's a very attractive situation. And I think it, they need, it needs to be considered more seriously by water planners.
So there's our summary of these um, these cluster tanks. We, we reckon you need about 190 uh, households connected to make it work economically. Um, now the the actual capital cost is lower in cost for an individual tank, but the actual cost per kiloliter is substantially higher. I know that sounds a little odd, but that's because the running costs are higher for individual tanks. Now moving on to energy, this was another part of the serendipity things that we we found out during this uh, this work. Um, if you were to desalinate, I mean, if you're a planner, what do you what a planner? What are your alternatives? Well, let's put another desalination plant in, and apart from the capital cost, they're actually quite energy hungry, or at least the numbers, the technology that we have installed in Australia over the last decade is any energy hungry. I, I and I still think they're, they're probably more around the three mark than anything lower. If you were to pump water from A to B uh, around southeast Queensland, it would take a little over a kilowatt per kilolitre to move it around. If we'd have purified recycled water, and I might add that we spent close to a billion dollars putting in a purified recycled water plant, uh, which is in mothballs at the moment, and the energy used for that was around two and a half kilowatt hours. And Traveston Dam, which was going to be a new dam, which was going to cost um, well over a billion dollars, it ended up getting nixed on environmental grounds because of a turtle, uh, which I think everyone was pleased with, <laughs> uh, except um, except perhaps the government at the time. Um, it was going to, uh, the estimated energy cost there was 26 and you can see down here, rainwater uh, is around the five mark. So you can see that if we're going to do a lot of rainwater substitution, you're going to be paying a substantial energy penalty. Now, when I say substantial, substantial relative to the alternatives, not necessarily substantial to your energy consumption inside the house in terms of your hot water use or the, the use of uh, other appliances you know, like a refrigerator. So... People um, think that um, that, uh, that with rainwater with pumps, if a little pump might do the job, a bigger pump will do an even better job. So here's some some information of um, the specific energy use, which we've been talking about for different pump sizes. So this is ranging from this is a small pump, 0.2 kilowatts. Now, um, just for horsepower people, um, one kilowatt is equal to uh, sorry, 750 watts is equal to one horsepower. So there's a very small pump and there's a quite a very large pump. And you can see here that if you're going to connect a large pump to the dishwasher and supply that water to the dishwasher, you're going to pay a pretty high energy penalty. And really, if you could get away with this um, with the smaller pump, you'd be much better off in terms of the energy consumption. And you can see here that the numbers, the differences between pumps vary depending on the end use. And that's rather interesting. These other graphs, not to worry too much, other than to say that they just demonstrated the pressure that was supplied and all that other stuff was okay. If you actually um, look at the flow rate, the specific energy against the flow rate for one of these pumps, these pumps are designed to run flat out, either flat out or not at all. So basically, if you're letting the rainwater pump run flat out, it'll use about one kilowatt uh, per one kilowatt hour per kilolitre. But if you connect it up to a dishwasher or a toilet or a front-loading washing machine, all of which have valve systems that restrict the flow rate into the device, you can see here that for a dishwasher, the flow rate is throttled back down to about 5 uh, litres per minute instead of the 30 litres per minute that the pump can supply. The consequence of that is, is that the, the pump's working flat out, basically heating up the water inside the pump and, uh, and really wasting a whole lot of energy. So this, this was a really um, uh, interesting insight because most engineers at the time talked about pump efficiency and a bunch of other things, none of which really explained uh, what was going on in terms of why rainwater pumps use so much energy. And this was a really very clever piece of work that was done by my CSIRA colleagues. Um, and... Uh, and then if, and if, if what a header tank is, um, so here I've got this word header tank. A, a brief a background. In World War II, when uh, London was bombed uh, by the Nazis, the uh, water supply was was often interrupted, the, the reticular water supply. So everybody, well, there's header tanks were put in the roofs of houses. You know, it's perhaps uh, 50 or 100 gallons. And it supplied water to the house until the main supply could be uh, reconnected, reticulated system. 
So um, that's where the header tanks come from. So it's basically just a reservoir of water that's in the roof and it can supply the house by gravity. And you can see here that, that if you uh, ended up um, using a header tank, very low energy use uh, for the different uh, pumps compared with, uh, compared with direct supply. So the reason for this is, is that because even so a big pump, a 750 kilowatt, 750 watt pump, really didn't end up using up much more energy than the small one because this was running flat out, this was running flat out because it was filling up a 300 litre uh, 300 litre header tank which then supplied the appliances by gravity. So um, now header tanks are fairly difficult to put into roofs of houses because structurally houses, house roofs uh, ceilings aren't strong enough and also if it's a single storey house you often don't have enough hydraulic head to open the solenoid valves that are in uh, just about every uh, domestic appliance that uses water. So the alternative to that is to have these pressure tanks. Uh, this is the Davy pump we saw before or something similar to it. Um, and this is a pressure vessel. Another nifty little device. Basically, this is a this is a, a pressure container, steel pressure container. So that fellow there, is that what you see there? That yellow container is this fellow here. Inside that is a bladder, a flexible bladder. And what happens is that, that um, you, when you, the pump goes on, this fills this bladder with water, so it expands it like a balloon, the air gets compressed, and when you turn on the tap, uh, the water is actually pressed out, it is forced out by this hydraulic pressure, and so the pump doesn't have to come on. So the consequence of that is that uh, when you use a uh, pressure vessel, you can see here that the, uh, the energy use, uh, where's the toilet system there here? There was a substantial reduction, a 33% reduction in toilet system energy use when you used a pressure vessel. So that's the grey boxes. There are the are the pressure uh, is the results from the pressure vessels. The blue is when you just got the pump directly connected to the toilet in this particular case, or the dishwasher, or, or so on. So yeah, they're a, a pretty nifty idea, pressure vessels. Now moving on to the um, uh, the other part of the. Con uh, uh, presentation which is most important uh, it's important to have water but it's even just about as important to have clean water because if it makes you sick it's not going to work for anyone that's the um, we did some initial studies of uh, water quality at Payne Road uh, the one that I showed you right at the, the go get uh, the, the posh subdivision and the EC was very low and the pH was a bit acid but the Langlier index was a bit high, uh, in fact, that this would cause corrosion. But we also had quite high numbers of E. coli and Legionella, which really piqued our interest. You know, um, this, was, uh, this was untreated, of course. So, and Payne Road at the time, well, it did have a disinfection system. It wasn't, disinfection systems aren't, aren't at all common on individual rainwater tanks. <clears throat> um, so, we weren't the only people that were uh, interested in rainwater quality. Here's lead and, um, and pH. So if you're going to look at lead on a uh, urban roof, according to this, there's an 80% chance, more or less, that the water quality isn't going to meet the Australian drinking water guidelines, which in this case is 10 micrograms of lead per litre. Um, if you go to a um, rural roof, the number goes down to oh, about 45%. So in other words, about 45% of rural homes won't meet the lead um, uh, quality issue. And so on for pH, as you can see, for, for urban roofs. Um, this is also, now part of this was the thought, we had a, um, a, a student, Rob Houston, who did a very detailed investigation of uh, chemical water quality coming off roofs in Brisbane, um, and in fact, 369 uh, roofs. And he showed that if you had lead flashing, you ended up having violative levels in your tank. So these these fellows here, percentage of tanks with lead levels greater than 10 micrograms, going up to um, uh, almost 30%. Whereas if you didn't have lead flashing, uh, very low, well, quite a low, you know, around about 8%. Um, had um, had violative levels of lead. So it's not as if they went to zero, but still much less than if you had lead flashing. What's lead flashing? It's the, it's the sealer. If you're trying to uh, seal a chimney, 
through a, uh, a roof, let's say a tile roof, you've got to have something that at the junction that stops the water seeping through the cracks and they use this, this lead uh, sheeting um, to, to join the, the two structures and that sheeting is called flashing. It doesn't have to be made out of lead, but that's the historic way it was done. So lead obviously in roofs are a bit of an issue, but it's not just that. Clearly, if we've got 8% of the roofs which have still got high lead levels, uh, it's still a bit of an issue. And this, um, there was uh, some work done uh, by another uh, PhD student. Uh, I just can't remember her name. She, that lady now works for Melbourne Water. She found that um, around 20% of, uh, of, drink, of, how, of rainwater in urban areas had a violative level of lead. In other words, it was more than 10 milligrams per litre. And that wasn't due to flashing, or to lead flashing. And these are similar similar studies you can see. This is the, the standard deviation. Um, some very high numbers here from Kusa's uh, work, but generally 20% is a lot of a lot of houses with violated levels of lead, and you don't want your kids to be drinking lead. Um, and this was a, a case. Um, this is Kusa's work. He said, "Well, let's have a look at uh, what happens in the first bit of runoff and and." And the number of days, because let's assume we assume that if you don't have lead flashing, how does lead get on a roof? Well, obviously from atmospheric depositions. So here's a case of having 15 rain-free rain days, 19 and 22. This is the first bit of runoff in the first millimetre. Very high concentrations, you know, 100 to 300. And by the time you get down to maybe two millimetres of runoff, you're down to the about 10 milligram micrograms per litre. So the Australian drinking water standards met. So you'd have to actually lose quite a lot of water uh, from each rainfall event um, if you're going to um, if you're going to reach the uh, appropriate concentrate drinking water guidelines for lead. And and uh, while I won't sh be showing it in this presentation, changing the amount of first flush, which is in this case I'm suggesting, you know, you would have to discard the first two millimeters, would have a major effect uh, in, on the yield from the tanks. Uh, in fact, it would reduce the yield from 80% somewhere down to 60%. So the other thing is just because you build it doesn't mean it's going to work all the time. <clears throat> um, and if it's a bit like buying a car and never servicing it. So even if you bought yourself an Audi and you never took it to the, uh, to the dealer to be serviced, you can't expect the Audi to be working well in five years' time or perhaps even two years' time. So this, there's a, there was a study done by a chap called uh, Magnus uh, Moglia, a CSIRO chap who's a social scientist, and they did an audit of 417 households in the Melbourne metropolitan region. So there's the graphic of Melbourne and those dots are the homes that he went to, and that's the Melbourne city centre there. And um, he found that, um, that about 13% of those tanks were on hazardous foundations. In other words, the slab was cracked or it was tilting. The pump wasn't working, um, and the switching valve, remember that switching valve which switched between the mains water supply and the tank water supply? It wasn't working, so consequently the house had no rainwater supply. It was all supplied all supplied by the mains water. Mesh failure, this is these are the meshes that are on the inlet and outlet. And if they're not if they're not if they don't have uh, integrity, then mosquitoes can uh, get in. And in fact, 12% of the tanks had mosquito larvae. Why do we care about that? Because of arboviruses, things like Ross River fever and Murray Valley encephalitis, these are dreadful um, 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 uh, complaints, diseases, illnesses that you get. In fact, uh, Ross River fever is called breaking bone fever. And the reason for that is, is that your bones ache so badly that it feels as if they're broken. And there's really no cure other than bed rest. And it'll last for up to three months. So you don't want to get one of these viruses. So it's a high alert from the public health officials. Block first flush device. This is the stuff that stopped the leaves, you know, getting into the tank. Well, the leaves accumulated on the on the screen, and consequently, you're not going to get the water going into the tank. Lots of debris in the gutter. Fecal matter in the gutter. Well, here we're talking about possum poo and bird poo. Discoloured water. Um, that was a big issue because, I mean, if you're flushing the toilet with rainwater, and it still turns, and, and after the flush. The colour is still uh, so a brownie colour, or it's certainly anything other than the, the white ceramic um, 
uh, colour that you'd see from from pure water, um, you would have to be aesthetically you'd be, be a bit put off by that. And in fact, some of the people at Payne Road, um, the regulation wouldn't allow them to have the eucalypt trees that were overhanging their roof removed. So they've got a lot of stains in their water, and so that they by their just w without permission of the body corporate, um, completely disconnected from the rainwater system. They were so appalled by the colour. So that's a big issue, you know. If you if you can't have can't have uh, clear looking water, you're not going to be very keen on using it in the house. And of course, if it smells, well, that's the end of it. Because as we know, anything that smells unpleasant, we uh, hide wired to stay away from. Um, so now, but having said all that, apart from the lead, the, most of those things are to do with um, either the efficiency of the system, such as the switching valve always giving you mains water instead of rainwater, or, um, uh, or, or the, the lead uh, issue, which is more of a, a chronic uh, problem, not to be dismissed. But something that could make you sick within a few days is a pathogen. And so from those uh, Legionella and E. coli, which uh, we found for, for, for Payne Road, we ended up doing a, started off with a very, it turned out to be a very uh, detailed investigation of pathogen uh, currents and survival in rainwater systems in southeast Queensland. These are the things we're worried about. There's fecal pollution, birds sitting on TV antenna or on the roof, possums, um, also lizards and birds, but you can see fruit bats, um, which are flying foxes and they fly over the roof and like a lot of birds, they uh, evacuate on the run, on the, on the flight, so to speak, on the wing. So how does that compare with what the community thought? Well, most people think it's, um, it's OK, it's safe to drink. You know, I, I visited uh, Grandma when I was a kid. This is how the story goes, uh, on a farm. And uh, she only had a rainwater tank, and it was fine. She was fine, we were fine. So look, I don't think it, there's anything to worry about. That's the reason that sort of the community thought that everything was OK. Um, now, partially supported by some epidemiological studies and in South Australia, which I'm going to talk about later, and there were some contradictory results. We certainly had pathogens recorded in rainwater, and we also, but on the other hand, we also had other studies which showed it was safe for drinking. So a bit odd, but that's the... But here are some cases um, with my uh, colleague, Warri Shamed. We, we did a review of uh, the incidence of people getting sick from rainwater. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Virgin Islands. And you can see here that there were quite a lot of people, uh, or, or that when there was an incident, of course, there had to be quite a lot of people for an incident to be an incident. Usually just one person getting sick um, doesn't qualify as a paper, doesn't qualify as getting interest to the um, health regulator and hence turning it into a paper at some stage. There's obviously an exception there and there, but generally it needs a few people. And so we seem to have some empirical evidence um, that, um, uh, that rainwater can make you sick. The problem with all these studies is, is that by the time the person who gets sick is, is tested it, and they then go back and they identify it as the rainwater tank, not the, the buffet uh, food that they were eating at the resort, um, the rainwater has been used and there's a new set that's come in which may or may not have had the pathogen that caused the illness in the first place. So again, ambiguity. Um, now the epidemic, epidemiological studies, this is, um, this is quite neat. This should be very comforting to people who believe in epidemiology. And of course, who's advising us <laughs> about COVID work is epidemiologists. But, and, and it's a very useful discipline, but there are some limitations to it. Um, now, this is Jane Hayworth's work, a very nice piece of work. She looked at about two or 3,000 preschoolers, came to school, first year at school in South Australia, and, found, and they did a survey of whether they came from homes that drank rainwater or not. And then they, found, and then they co correlated that with the number of self-reported cases of gastroenteritis, in other words, asking the parent whether the child uh, had frequent or infrequent uh, bouts of, of gastro. And the, and the statistical analysis said, no difference between of gastroenteritis and kids that drink rainwater against the kids that didn't. In, um, in the same research group, um, this lady, uh, Rodrigo, um, did a very sophisticated study, this double-blind randomised control. This is the gold standard of, of, um, of studies where you actually install real and sham water treatment devices and neither the householder 
nor the nor the researcher knows which is real and which is not. And they do individual monitoring of each household as to the incidence of gastroenteritis. No statistical difference. Uh, now that sort of methodology was used to provide data which allowed Melbourne Water to save themselves close to one or two billion dollars, billion dollars, uh, to um, so they didn't have to put in uh, rain in filtering into their their uh, potable water supply because they've got um, con they've got controlled access catchments, um, they've got forested catchments, and they really have high quality water. And their study was to find out whether there were other things coming in that they should filter out, like every other big water utility in Australia. And uh, the SELT study, using the same protocol, showed that there would be no effect of uh, filtering the water on illness. So fecal indicators, um, E. coli, enterococci, and Clostridium perfringens C. Um, Clostridia perfringens can cause food poisoning. E. coli can either be pathogenic or it can just be uh, commensural. It just hangs around. Present, um, they're not necessarily pathogenic. Um, uh, Clostridium is, in the sense that it, it causes diarrhea. But generally, just because you've got E. coli doesn't mean that you've got a pathogen, because they um, that they can replicate, uh, and uh, you can't you can't demonstrate whether whether the, the fecal uh, a fecal um, uh, coliform that comes from a person is far, far more health risk than a fecal coliform that comes from a a, a, a possum, for example. So consequently, we. Um, developed or adopted the use of uh, polymerase chain, re chain reaction PCR, quantitative PCR. We're one of the early adopters of that in Australia. So we could actually uh, measure the incidence of pathogens, the type of pathogens and their number by uh, looking at the RNA or DNA uh, signatures. And so we uh, sampled 82 tanks uh, in the Gold Coast multiple times sometimes. Um, and uh, these are the faecal indicators we looked at, the E. coli, the intercroci, the clostridium. Here were the pathogens, though. Eremonas, Campylobacter. Uh, well, Campylobacter is, is, sorry, is the one that causes food poisoning. Clostridium perfringens is, um, Clostridium, of course, is the, the one that causes botulism. I'm not sure whether perfringens does it, though. E. coli, Giardia. Well, Giardia causes a pathogen. Legionella, a gastropathogen. Um, uh, it, uh, it makes you... Uh, it makes you sick, but you can actually treat it with antibiotics. Legionella, of course, is, is a, a respiratory uh, pneumonia type device. And Salmonella, which is pathogenic and, of course, um, causes um, substantial problems with gastro and other things. So there are pictures, I mean, of those things. They're, they're all sort of, sort of interesting in their own way, but it's really what they can do. Um, it sort of look harmless as a picture, but their ability to make you sick is quite amazing. This is my colleague, Warish Ahmed. Uh, the reason I show this picture is, is that Warish has been at the forefront of uh, measuring pathogens in environmental samples for about the last uh, two decades. Um, and when we did this work, whether the, this is, whether they, the, the gene was there or not, you can see here that for Legionella, eight out of the 84 samples, Salmonella, and Giardia, these are the ones that had a relatively high incidence and not so for the, for the others. Because remember, the chances of um, having human faecal contamination on your roof is very, very remote. So it's got to come from animals. Um, now, what do we do with those numbers? Now, what, how do you turn 17 positives from 84 samples into a quantitative, into a risk assessment of some, some form or other? Well, we do that with uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment. We need to know the pathogens. We need to know the adjusted volume. We need to know the dose response. We need to know the exposures and the infection frequency in the population. So basically, what are the ingestion rates? Well, you can drink it. You can uh, have hosing and you ingest droplets. You can in ingest droplets during showering. So that's an issue with Legionella. Um, or you could actually have a pressure hose. There was a case in New Zealand where uh, there was an outbreak of um, Legionella, I think, if I remember correctly, in some houses next to a boatyard, where the boatyard was hosing pressure pressure washing hulls of boats, and the droplets and aerosols moved across the road, and it would appear that the water that was used had Legionella in it, and it ended up making the residents across from the boatyard um, get infected with Legionella. But that's a, a fairly unusual circumstance. But we were interested in aerosols because we wanted to know 
whether they ended up in the lungs or whether they ended up um, in the intestinal tract because um, Legionella in the stomach has no effect. Legionella in the lungs has an enormous effect. Um, Giardia in the lungs presumably doesn't have much of an effect, but Giardia in the stomach has an enormous, has an enormous effect. So, um, again, just a bit of an anatomy of whether it's ending up going into your gut or whether it's going into the lungs. And at a certain size, you've got to be less than six microns to get in there and cause the problem. That's a, there's a whole study of that of how you size aerosols from, from irrigation and, uh, and uh, water sources, but we won't be talking about that today. Dose response, well, how, much, how, much, how many infective units, like a plaque forming unit, do you need to ingest to make yourself sick, to get people sick? So um, you can see here that um, if you had, uh, say, you know, something like a couple of hundred uh, units of, in this case, uh, salmonella, you don't only have, you have maybe 10 people per 10,000 people that get sick, whereas for these other fellows, Legionella and Giardia, about 100% of the people would get sick if they ingested that sort of dose. So you can see that this is a much, these fellows here, Legionella and Giardia, are much more potent at causing illness than, say, Salmonella in terms of the number of infective units you have to ingest. So clearly, Salmonella um, would have to be usually come from uh, ingestion of, of water or food. So when we did these sums, and, and there's a fair bit of complexity behind these numbers, which I'm not going into, but what I'd like to point out is that for salmonella, the liquid ingestion via drinking, so that's, um, that's somewhere between 10 and 53, uh, the, just the way the units are. Giardia, um, this is called giardiasis, which is uh, uh, somewhere between 20 and 130. And Legionella, hardly anything. So again, this is calculations from knowing the concentration of the pathogens in the tank, the uh, likely ingested volume, the dose response, and the number of times per year people are likely to be exposed to that infective risk. And so there we are. This is the summary of that table. You're likely to have somewhere between uh, 10 and 50 for Salmonella, 10 and 100, 20 or 130 for Giardia, and less than one for Legionella. And, and we say, well, well, what's acceptable, you know, because um, people get sick and die all the time of different reasons. Um, the US EPA say an acceptable risk of doing of an alternative source is one extra case of illness per 10,000 people per year. Uh, now, whether that's considered to be too conservative or not is another matter, but nonetheless, using their criteria, and that's the criteria that's used by most people um, in most health professionals in the world today, you can see here that Salmonella and Giardia would appear to be quite a substantial risk for people um, uh, ingesting undisinfected rainwater in uh, southeast Queensland. So um, the question is, is the sky falling? Uh, is that real or is it just another model? And when I say is it just another model, remember, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So said George Box, and we need to remind ourselves of that on a fairly regular basis. There's only about five reported cases of salmonella. There's a per 10,000 people per year in Queensland. There's a disease reporting um, process that's required, where if someone goes to a hospital or a doctor and they diagnose is that it has to be reported to the um, um, disease surveillance uh, section of the health department. Did I for giardiasis? And so, really, what we're predicting. And this, of course, is not quite comparing apples with apples. We're talking about, say, up to 50 cases of, of, of uh, Salmonella and up to 130 cases of uh, Giardiasis. You can see five for Giardiasis, five for Salmonella. So, you know, uh, we seem to be over-predicting, uh, or, of course, there are some, some other reasons. 8,000 cases of gastro per 10,000 people in Australia. So that's generally the, the number that um, Chris uh, Hayard used. He's a well-respected... Um, infection disease um, epidemiologist who did that classic work for Melbourne Water. So really, if you've got a disease which is, uh, or symptoms, you know, gastroenteritis, whether it's from eating a, a, a dodgy meat pie versus a drinking water which is contaminated, very hard to pick it up. Uh, it's just the background is so high. So it makes it very challenging to actually uh, pin a smoking gun on a pathogen in, in rainwater. The other thing is that we've got about one and a half million 
Australian households, so multiply that by about three, so over 4 million Australians out of 26 million drink rainwater, including myself, uh, with no apparent ill effects. So, you know, this is consistent with um, people's expectation that drinking rainwater is not going to make you sick that I talked about earlier. However, here are some of the limitations with what we've done. Just because you get a positive PCR test doesn't mean that uh, it's come from cells that are viable because PCR is looking at the DNA or the RNA. It's not looking at whether the cell it comes from is actually viable. And that's just uh, one of the limitations of PCR. Of course, householders will use disinfection. The dose response that I showed you, those graphs look very nice, but in fact, the actual data is a lot messier than that. Um, there's the underreporting of disease incidents, e.g., you know, there's lots of people that get gastro, they don't all go to the doctor. And the other thing is, and this is probably pretty important, uh, acquired immunity. Um, sometimes uh, when people come to our house, when I say people, I'm talking about family, maybe the first one or two times they they come, they, they do mention that they, they might have a little bit of gastro, but uh, after that, it disappears. They seem to acquire an immunity. Now, that's not going to work for people that are immunocompromised because they had a heart transplant or they're on cancer therapy or something like that. So I don't want to just, just um, sort of suggest that acquired immunity is, is a panacea. But for most people, it seems to work. So in terms of quantitative uh, risk assessment, uh, we think that... Um, we, we think that it's going to give a better estimate than the, the epidemiology uh, and public health surveillance, um, at least in terms of policy. Um, but we're still a bit uncertain whether it makes you sick if you drink it. The background gastro and um, the also the, the, the predicted incidence is far higher. And the other thing is pathogens might always be in the tank. You know, they might be here because the flying foxes fly over, you know, a certain month of the year. And so basically your pathogens are irregular visitors rather than a border. So moving on to the end of the talk, um, our conclusions from all of this is that we have, Australia has the highest per capita ownership of uh, rainwater tanks in the world. I didn't talk about Germany, America, France, uh, or Korea, uh, but I can in the conversation if you like. Basically due to drought, that millennial drought was an absolute motivator to seriously think about other ways of, of, um, of supplying urban water regulations we talked about such as basic the subsidies that come from government and also the environmental ethic to do the right thing little tanks can do supply really high volumes of water provide you draw them down daily in other words you use them with it for on appliances like a toilet or a hot water system or a laundry that are used every day and more or less your rainfall is going to come every month of the year but if you don't maintain the tanks at an individual householder level it's a serious issue and it's unresolved because it's going to decrease the efficacy of, of uh, rainwater supply. Um, why does it matter? Well, if you're water planning and you're saying that I no longer have to supply 60 kilolitres, the first 60 kilolitres per household per year, I don't have to supply from the mains because the tank can do that. Uh, in fact, if that's not true because um, people don't look after their tanks, um, then that's a, an issue and you can't really use that assumption. So. Tanks supplying alternative water supplies uh, become a much more ambiguous um, solution. Um, however, uh, with these little pumps, they incur large en energy penalties unless they run flat out. And we talked about using a pressure vessel to get around a lot of that problem. Communal tanks are jolly attractive, you know. Um, they certainly can be cost effective uh, with traditional mains water supply and they have high reliability. They get treated to potable standards. They have professional maintenance, and they're and they're cost effective. Um, but you know this um, level of lead uh, that's occurring in twenty percent of urban rainwater tanks. This is a, a, a bit of a concern, and uh, needs to be either thought about whether you have to use uh, ion exchange to get it out, uh, which is going to be uh, quite possible for communal tanks. Unreasonable to expect it to, to be used on urban ta individual tanks. But the good news is there were no other chemical contaminants. There wasn't cadmium. There wasn't uh, organic compounds. This is the work that Rob Houston did and other people. Basically, it's the heavy metals and not the heavy metals. It's lead that's the big issue. Sometimes you might get a bit of cadmium, but you have to be next to a cadmium emitter, like a, a glass factory. Um, it doesn't usually meet conventional drinking water standards, um, uh, uh, particularly in terms of E. coli, because the drinking water standards don't have pathogens. They use E. coli as the indicator.
and the, the health issue is unresolved. I believe, you know, the, the risk assessment, quantitative risk assessment and pathogen says there's an issue. Epidemiology says not. Common sense says not, but it's unresolved. You know, certainly I wouldn't uh, take it to the bank. So if you're going to drink it, I would suggest you disinfect it. Finally, uh, I'd just like to remind you that um, this talk was based on the findings of this uh, this book, which in turn was the outcome of about five years of research that was um, funded uh, by various people in southeast Queensland uh, during the Millennium Drought, in fact, the Urban Water Security Research Alliance. And the book can be downloaded for free um, at this um, at this at this uh, web link. So, Dendra and Ben, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Toad. Thank you that, very much. Yeah, that was really, really interesting, especially as I'm hoping to be moving to uh, in the near future to an area with a rainwater capture system. So this this gives me a great set of information to figure out if I'm doing it right or not. So um, we. We did have yep. a couple of questions that came in in the chat window. And Ben, can I have you scroll back and, and look at those to make sure we answer them? Uh, one that came in via text was actually when you were talking about the individual capture tanks. And uh, after the yep. breaking of the drought, then the mandatory use of them um, was no longer necessary, but on the other hand, there was a significant number of failures uh, for one reason or other. And the question came in that if you have a collection of individual tanks, is there any uh, evidence or experience in your knowledge of municipalities enacting what we would call here a responsible management entity, where the tanks were on individual property, but they were managed as part of the water utility company? Yeah, um, the answer is no. Um, Australians feel about their rainwater tanks the way Americans feel about guns that they believe it's their right to have it and it's their right to manage it and they don't want to have the any government authority interfering with it. Now, that's based on quite a lot of social research um, that um, um, they would argue, people would argue, if you only t t tell me what to do, I'd do it. Um, but I'm, I don't want uh, to pay any money to have it inspected, like an on-site sewage system, for example, which they do have to pay to have inspected every year or every quarter. Um, and we believe that it's our water and and we believe that we've already paid money to put it in and we don't want any more government interference. And the social research has shown that it's it's a it's a hot button issue and it has to be handled very carefully. And usually Australians are pretty laid back with most things about regulation if they think it's for the good of the community. But this seems to be one issue where um, they are really quite... Um, uh, quite possessive about their rights. So one of the questions was asked, it says, since filtration and disinfection processes are provided, what is the rationale for excluding the first flush of rainfall? Uh, well, the first flush is also going to carry some sediment and disinfection and filtration may not necessarily remove any of the soluble contaminants. Um, I would still, if, so if we're talking an individual tank, um, I would still probably recommend the first flush. Um, problem is, if you actually dig into it, um, how much of the load from a rainfall event is actually removed by the first flush? And the first flush is often, it's not one millimetre, it's usually something like 0.5 of a millimetre because the first flush devices usually are only of the order of 20 or 30 litres um, in, in size and volume, um, whereas a roof, the connected roof might be, say, 100 square metres and one millimetre of runoff from a 100 square metre roof is 100 litres. So, and these first flush devices are often about 20 litres. So really, it's only a fraction of a millimetre. And if you actually look at the total load of contaminant that comes in from, a, um, uh, from an individual event, perhaps you may only be removing something like 20% of it if you only remove the first 0.2 or 0.3 millimetres of rain in the first flush. 
So the argument is how effective are they in reducing the load uh, as opposed to the concentration is an area which needs um, more work. I, I did some, some calculations some years ago about it and became uh, rather sceptical about their efficacy in reducing the load of contaminants. But I would be, it would be a very bold person to, to recommend that they be disbanded. Uh, so I... I, I would still argue that they should be there, but I, I suspect they're not nearly as efficacious as, as we feel that they should be. So, um, and if you don't have them, you know, you are going to get the higher concentrations uh, coming through, which won't be removed by filtration or, or disinfection. But, um, and so that's the reason that the Fitzgibbon situation um, had the um, granular activated carbon uh, and, and the ion exchange to remove those trace elements, uh, those heavy metals. Trace um, elements. Ted, you were also asked um, for the subdivisions that you used as case studies with the communal rainwater harvesting. Um, who's responsible yeah. for the communal infrastructure? Who manages it? The body, corp the body corporate in the same way that they're responsible for the, for the internal roads and maintenance of the, of the communal spaces. Or in the case of Capo de Monte, well, let me go. In the case of Capo de Monte, uh, which is the retirement village, there's a body corporate that runs the, the whole deal, you know, so people have to pay a, a certain amount of rates each year, and that's run by the, the body corporate employees, of which there might be one or two. Um, in terms of um, Payne Road, well, it's again the body corporate again. In terms of Fitzgibbon, interesting situation, currently run by the Queensland government in the sense of a Queensland branch, the, the Land Development Corporation um, is responsible for its current running. When it's taken over by the water utility, which would be Queensland Urban Utilities, which supplies water to about 3 million people in southeast Queensland, um, in that situation, the water utility would have to take responsibility. And that's one of the reasons they're a bit wary of, of taking on more uh, obligations. There's a slide that's come up of Payne Road with all the linkages shown uh, for when I remember I said were, the linkages were broken well there it is there there's the tank and the overflow from the tank goes to the communal tanks and if there's not, not enough water uh, in the individual tanks then that kicks in and it supplies the individual tanks and if there's not enough water at all then the town's um, water comes in and backs it up at a low flow rate much lower than than, than uh, the um, designated uh, conditions of supply, you know, which is so many litres per, per minute at so many kilopascals of pressure. All this stuff here on the left-hand side is all to do with uh, on-site uh, treatment, which I didn't talk about. And the other thing is this is the firefighting pump. So there's the same reticulation system that supplies the backup order can also supply the fire flow. So it's, so it's a big pipe, you know, big, uh, it's a 100 millimetre pipe or so. With high pressure and as I said this was a very innovative clever solution and like a lot of clever solutions they're often quite simple. Okay um, there are a lot of people who have stuck around for a one on one conversation and so at this point Ted I want to say thank you so much for this has been a really uh, interesting and informative session. So let me um, say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This will be posted to our YouTube account, where obviously if English is not your primary language, you can enable translation services, and you can also enable closed captioning. So thank you again, and do come back on, I believe it's June 1st or June 2nd for the next one in the Australia Sister series, looking at uh, small advanced on-site wastewater systems. So thank you, Ted. Let me uh, stop the recording.